And here we go. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Jeffrey Hanna at Atlas Health Australia. Hope you are doing well here today. And welcome again to The Big Idea. What is The Big Idea? It's where we take a article, we take a piece of research and all that sort of stuff, and we try to break it down. As many of you may know, research can be really, really tricky to read. We have to translate these things sometimes into plain English so that both we as the practitioners, but even more importantly, you as the people who may be experiencing these things can actually understand what are the different options available to you. Now, as you know, or if you are new to the channel here, then what you will quickly discover is that brevity is not my strength. So I am very good at taking an idea that can perhaps be summarized in this length of time, but then stretching it out over a lot longer using a lot more words. But why do we do that? We do that so that we can explain these ideas so that even if it does take that little bit longer, that you actually understand the relationships. And again, you know what to be able to do with it. And what we are going to be talking about today here is going to be something that's super useful to understand for people who experience either A, what's called a chronic fatigue syndrome, or B, what's called a fibromyalgia. So um, just before we get the uh, ball rolling here on the topic today, then uh, firstly, you know, if uh, you know you find value in this video, please be sure that you're going to be sharing it with other people who may need it. Um, but also then if you would uh, click the subscribe, because what that does is that helps and also the like button, because what that does is that helps to boost this video so that other people who might need this information are able to find it as well. So Formalities aside, let's get the ball rolling here. The link between idiopathic, intracranial, hypertension, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Exploration of a shared pathophysiology. This is an interesting article. came out Journal of Pain Research back in 2018. So a few years old, but as you know, many of you know that I already feel about this, one does not have to keep proving that gravity exists year after year. So principles and things, even if they are a few years old, guess what? Still super duper useful. So as we do, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the abstract, the summary version first. We're going to fly through it rapid fast, hitting the highlight points, and then we are going to circle back to it, translate what this means. Are you ready? Here we go. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is a condition characterized by raised intracranial pressure. What it causes is pain in the arms and legs resulting from associated increased spinal pressure and forcing tilting of the spinal nerves, or excuse me, forced filling of the spinal nerves with cerebrospinal fluid, widespread pain, and also several other characteristics of idiopathic intracranial um, uh, uh, hypertension shear notable similarities with characteristics of fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome to overlapping pain conditions. Interesting. The shared characteristics of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome that may be caused by increased intracranial pressure include headaches, fatigue, cognitive impairment, loss of gray matter, involvement of cranial nerves, and overload of the lymphatic olfactory pathway. Increased pressure in the spinal canal and in peripheral nerve sheaths causes widespread pain, weakness in the arms and legs, walking difficulties, aka ataxia, and bowel, bladder, and sphincter problems. Additionally, Intra idiopathic intracranial hypertension, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome are frequently associated with sympathetic overactivity syndromes. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue syndrome share a large variety of symptoms that might all be explained by the same pathophysiology of increased cerebrospinal pressure. Then what they do, and this is pretty rare in articles, I think it's pretty cool, is they actually give a plain language summary. In other words, they take out as much of the jargon as possible to try to distill things and break them down into its real uh, message. These findings are relevant is that they provide an alternative hypothesis concerning the pathophysiological mechanisms in fibromyalgia and cerebral, uh, excuse me, chronic fatigue syndrome. In other words, they're offering a possible explanation, one that really hasn't been talked about too terribly much in terms of why people go on to experience the symptoms associated with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So what does all of that mean? And what does it mean in terms of what the options are available to you and what you can do if you are experiencing something like this? So firstly, what is worth noting here, just as a bit of introduction, it's that fibromyalgia 
chronic fatigue, these are what are known as diagnoses of exclusion. And by that, it means that people experience chronic fatigue, they experience brain fog, they experience just general lethargy. As much as they want to go, they don't have the energy to do it. They also can have full body um, pain, trigger points, to where just everything feels absolutely hard and heavy and you can get absolutely wiped out by doing the subtlest of things. Now, why is it a diagnosis of exclusion? It's because we can't find any one thing that causes it. Why is that? Because there is not just one thing that causes it. So a lot of times people have talked about, uh, because of its association with the PTSD, that there is a um, psychosocial mental component, overload of stress. Other people say it's uh, nutritional deficiencies. Other people say it's because of heavy metal toxicities or other chemical exposures. Others say it's because of mold sensitivities. Others say that it's because of... Um, uh, other kinds of pesticides, other things like that. And other people say it's physical. In other words, there's a lot, a lot of um, shifting pieces in terms of what goes into this, but there is no one size fits all issue here. And as a result, it can confuse most practitioners. Why? Because if they've been taught and trained to be looking for the one characteristic thing, guess what? You're not going to find it. Just because a person maybe has been exposed to something like an Epstein-Barr virus does not guarantee that they're going to go on to experience chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. Or similarly, just because a person, you know, has that doesn't necessarily mean that they have it in their system either. And so what I oftentimes talk about is the idea of a combination lock recognizing that you can actually have more than one thing going on or maybe perhaps a, a slightly different way if you were to talk about you know how do you get from my office um you know, which is located in north brisbane to get to the, the cbd okay well your first option is you can go along the bruce highway and then the gateway it's like, okay, well, let's say that there's a traffic accident, which happens oh so terribly commonly. Well, then what you can do is you can go down uh, right up through the guts on the A1 along Old Gimpy Road. It's like, okay, well, if there's a traffic accident there, oh, you might need to take Sandgate Road. Okay, if there's an accident there, you may have to go on the Old North Road um, down uh, Boundary. And if that's blocked, you may have to go all the way around on the other side of the hills and come back, you know, over the, the range, back through uh, Fernie Grove and all of that sort of stuff. My point is, is that there's multiple ways to get to the same destination. And the same thing seems to go as it relates to fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's about risk factors. It's about combinations of different things. And if it was just one simple thing, guess what? We wouldn't need to be having this conversation here right now. Why? Because there'd be somebody out there who'd have all of the answers for everybody and these things wouldn't exist. Now, until we have that, then we have to consider multiple pieces. Some pieces may be responsible for 10% of the problem. Other people or other issues may be responsible for 20% and others may be 50%. And guess what? Those percents are different in every single person. And so as much as we would like to say straightforward, simple, even the information I'm going to be sharing with you, that is not the case at all. So diagnosis of exclusion means that you rule out brain tumor, pathology, bleeding, any of those kinds of things there. And then from the traditional medical perspective, they say, we can't find what is definitively causing this. And yet you're still experiencing all these symptoms. Therefore, we're going to put a label on it and we're going to call it either a chronic fatigue or a fibromyalgia. That is it. So chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, these are not things that you get. These are not things that you test for and say, yep, there's the marker for it. That's the case. No, it's that you're experiencing something and your practitioners, your specialists, your everybody is going to have to work most likely together as a team to figure out what is actually the situation that's going on for you and then what's the resolution going to need to be. And so... What these guys in this particular article are talking about is they're talking about a particular physical mechanism that is contributing towards fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue. And they discuss it in terms of something that is called idiopathic intracranial hypertension. 
So let's break that down here for you in terms of what does that mean. Idiopathic simply put means cause unknown. So they're identifying that there's a condition, but it's an effect. And they're saying we don't know 100% what's causing it. Now, I'm going to propose a plausible explanation for what's causing this in the first place. Doesn't guarantee it, but, you know, we'll certainly, uh, it'll, it'll add up when we get there. So, cause unknown, intracranial means inside of the skull, hypertension, high pressure. So, fluids in the body. We've got blood. And then we also have what's called interstitial fluid. So if you think about all of the parts in your body with the blood vessels, the arteries, the veins, the capillaries, they're the ones that are sending blood to and from all of the major pathways along the way, like uh, roads, if you would. But then in order to get that fluid, those nutrients, the oxygen, all of that sort of stuff into the cells, what happens is it diffuses into the area around the cells. And it's basically a liquid environment that is just, you know, free-floating, coordinated stuff. It's what we call interstitial fluid. It's if you've ever had, say, a cut on your arm, you'll notice that there's that clear, watery fluid that's coming through it. It's not blood. It's not pus. That's an example of the interstitium. It's the fluid that bathes and supplies all of the good stuff to all of the cells in your body. Now, the same thing goes in terms of your brain. But it's a little bit different. See, blood is toxic to the brain cells themselves. And so you've got the blood going up to the brain through the major arteries and all that sort of stuff. But then what it has to do is it has to pass through a very, very tight barrier. It's called the brain, blood brain barrier. And basically, it only lets water, oxygen, glucose for sugar and energy and other very very tiny substances to pass in other words impenetrable under normal circumstances so that the fluid on the inside that is bathing and protecting the brain is as pristine and clear as it possibly can so this cerebrospinal fluid is what circulates from the brain, down your spinal cord, around some of the edges of the nerve roots in his back and is recycled like that. So think of it as just like the purest substance that you can possibly have. If and when the substance ever starts to get dirty because something has gotten across the barrier, for example, that shouldn't be there, that's why people can experience really, really bad, nasty problems if that is ever the case. Um, meningococcal, meningitis, those are just a few examples in terms of what happens when bad stuff gets across that barrier. So we're talking about the normal fluid that is normally bathing, protecting, and then providing energy to the brain. And we're saying and recognizing that there's a condition, there should be a normal volume that's the case. But if that volume was to ever go down, you know, that's not going to be good. We don't have enough stuff around the brain, but we can also have too much fluid. So let's say for the sake of argument that your blood is or your heart is sending 100 units of blood to your brain, it's circulating, but then for whatever the reason, it's only able to drain, let's say, 90 units away. Well, over a period of time, that excess is going to accumulate in that space, and what it's going to mean is that there's too much fluid. That is what intracranial hypertension is. Too much fluid on the inside and as a consequence of that you've got increased pressure if you would take your hand wrap your finger around like this your wrist you don't have to go too terribly hard but just enough to where you start to cut off the circulation to where the normal flow coming here is not being drained back as well the other way same thing when the blood goes up like this, gets stuck in the system and can't be drained back out. It causes an increase of pressure. And if you were to hold your hand like this long enough, well, guess what? You're going to start getting some weird, abnormal kinds of symptoms like this. And so what these people here are arguing, based on some of the research that they've done, they said, okay, we know that this condition exists called intracranial hypertension. And we also know that people experience fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, and we can't really figure out why this is actually happening. And so what they did is they wonder, it's like, okay, is it possible that these things may actually be connected? 
And so what they do is they do a series of lumbar punctures, which is the, the method where normally you can actually measure the amount of, um, you can measure the amount of uh, increased flu, or excuse me, the increased pressure inside of that vault because if the pressure is actually increased down in the lower part of the spine by default it's also increased in the upper part um, sometimes if it's really notable you can also see uh, signs of glaucoma where you're going to see the optometrist they look in your eye and they say whoa there's some you know increased pressure it's called papilledema you don't need to know that um, but in brief it's a sign that a person actually has this increased pressure for any number of uh, reasons here. And so what they do is they say, okay, is it possible that these are actually the same pathophysiology? In other words, if we look at the symptoms of intracranial hypertension, we look at the symptoms of chronic fatigue, and we look at symptoms of fibromyalgia, there's a huge amount of overlap. So is it possible that these actually have the same pathophysiology, that is the same underlying mechanism in terms of what causes it. And so what do they do? Well, they look at some of the different symptoms that are actually associated with these. So headaches, fatigue, brain fog is what they're referring to in terms of cognitive impairment where you just, you can't memorize anything. You got no real good long-term, no real good short-term memory, anything like that. Difficulty to con difficulty concentrating, but also then a whole array of neurological things that are going on in that person's body. And why is that? It's because when you've got an issue that's affecting the upper part of the brain right through here, you cannot disconnect this from the entire rest of the body. So when people, at least this is my opinion and experience, when people have multiple symptoms going on and they can write this huge laundry list, you know, odds are they do not actually have two or three dozen different things going wrong with them. Odds are that they have a similar or they have just a common one or two things and it's just showing up in a few dozen different ways. So what do they talk about? They talk about and basically do a little walkthrough of all of the different nerve systems of the body. And you can be chasing around to any number of different specialists, specialists who work as ENTs on the eyes, ears, nose, throat, specialists who work on the neurology and neurology of what? Of the brain, of the neck, of the hands, of the low back. You can be going to different organ specialists who work with the hormones, with the digestive system, with the cardiovascular system. And you can give it all of these different names based on the symptom that you may be experiencing in that time and the moment. But again, the most important thing in that, uh, in that situation then is to ask yourself, what is the underlying mechanism, knowing it's most likely not going to be something that is straightforward. Now, there's a difference between, you know, any given doctor, any given specialist, any given practitioner saying, you know what, I don't know, but this is what I do know, and this would at least seem to make sense versus, oh, we don't know, there's nothing that you can do, you're just going to have to live with it. And unfortunately, that is something that, you know, too many people who experience chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia are told. They said, we don't know what causes it, and so there's nothing that you can do. That's not good enough in my opinion. We don't always know what to do and not everybody, you know, is going to get resolutions and all that sort of stuff. But we got to be able to use our brain here a little bit and think what is possible, what is plausible, what is probable for the individual so that we're able to actually do something that would be able to help them out. So the point is, simply put, is that when in, you've got lots and lots of different symptoms all over the place, look for how these things can possibly be connected. And in brief, if you're having full body symptomatology, arguably, or at least most likely, it has something to do with something that is affecting your brain in some way or another. It doesn't always mean it is a psychological condition. No, it just means that something is affecting the way that your body is able to process information in the first place. So simply put, they just talk about all of these different symptoms in that way that, you know, can and are associated with how all of this works. So just ever so quickly, in terms of your sense of smell, your sense of sight, your sense of sensation on the face and your teeth, your ability to swallow, 
color, your sense of balance, your ability to taste things, your ability to hear things, your ability to maintain your center of gravity and your center of balance, your ability of your heart to work, your lungs to work, your digestive system to work, your reproductive system to work, your hormone system to work, and also, also, what is called your sympathetic system. Gross overgeneralization, but sympathetics are responsible for coordinating blood flow in your body, and it's associated with the fight, flight, freeze response. In other words, your body needs to engage in action at that moment. And in that is then heightened sense of alertness, but also then heightened sense of stress, anxiety response. And it's actually, it's a normal process. The caveat is if and when a person gets neurologically stuck in a rut, just spinning around like that, then what goes on to happen is then a person feels like they are in a perpetual state of anxiety and you ask them, you know, what's you know wrong? What's amiss? And they say, I don't know, but I feel this way. And sometimes this is a case where a bo your body is playing a trick on your brain and in turn, your brain is playing a trick on your mind. What you are feeling is quite very real. But whatever's creating that in the first place, it's a false response. And nevertheless, huge percent of people who experience chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, they get stuck in that basically sort of state in neurology, which is one of the reasons why commonly, again, it's associated with the PTSD and where there can and oftentimes is a certain uh, amount of you know psychological work that a person needs to do in order to get themselves out of that rut. So this is what they're kind of talking about, you know, in a little bit of a nutshell. In other words, lots and lots of different things going all over the place. Now, well, what does this actually mean that you can do about it? And again, you know, my role as an upper cervical chiropractor is, of course, to look and talk about conditions of the upper neck that can show up in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways in the body. In particular, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. So they only really talk about this ever so briefly in the very end. But like they talk about it from here to here. I want to elaborate on this. So I'm not putting words in these guys mouth. This is me then taking their information, which is basically what they're saying is that, hmm, intracranial hypertension, fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, they share very similar characteristics. So, hmm, maybe they could be under, they could be different manifestations of the same thing. So how could that be possible? That's what they're talking about here. And this, again, this is not what these guys are saying, but I'm going to elaborate on this to show you what very well could be possible and what the role of your upper neck actually has to do in all of this. Remembering again, this is not necessarily the cure for chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, or intracranial hypertension. No, we're talking about one potential piece of the puzzle albeit a very big and a very important one. So although from the medical perspective, they say they don't know what causes intracranial idiopathic hypert um, hypertension, growing evidence suggests that cerebral venous outflow obstruction due to transverse sinus stenosis may be the underlying cause. What are they basing this on? Because when they do an MRI and they look at that transverse sinus, 90% of patients with intracranial hypertension have a problem that shows up there and only 3% of healthy people don't. So, you remember that we talked about blood flow going up to the brain? Okay, that goes going to go up through arteries. Then it's circulated in the system, what we call that cerebral spinal fluid, should have a normal volume, but then it ultimately has to be cleansed and drained back to the heart. And there are kind of in a nutshell, there's two primary pathways by which that happens. So the first pathway is by the internal jugular vein, a pair of them actually, that go along the front of your neck like this. Pretty big things, uh, probably about that big. And they are the principal pathway of drainage for the blood from your brain. When you are lying down, so veins are loose and floppy little structures. Arteries, a lot of musculature on the inside. Veins, loose and floppy. And so when there are changes in pressure, they have the tendency to collapse. So me, I'm doing this video right now, I'm sitting up. What the research shows us is that when a person is in the upright posture, the internal jugular veins close a certain degree, which means that these normal four lane and one direction highways that are beautiful for draining blood from the brain 
they unfortunately are not available to do the work. In other words, yeah, it's rush hour, but the main highway is closed. Darn it. And it's good when you're lying down, the things open wide up like that. But when a person's in a upright position, the pathway that needs to be followed is what's called the cerebrospinal veins. So you've got a huge number of reservoirs. They're called um, uh, dural venous sinuses on the inside of your brain. And they drain blood from the brain and also from that cerebrospinal fluid itself. And what it typically does is it comes along a little pathway on the side. It's called the transverse sinus. It joins in the back of the neck here, and then it is drained out the back of the skull through the vertebrae in your neck. So stenosis is a fancy term that means narrowing. And this can be something that happens either because of trauma or it can actually be congenital, which means that you are born with it. I've had an MRI that turns out I actually have this on, a, I think it's the left side is the, uh, the short of it, where simply put, I have a narrowing where I don't have one of the, the normal transverse sinuses. In other words, you normally have a pair of these things. Well, I've only got the one and it's only on the right side. Lucky me. But what am I actually getting at? I'm getting at that when you're in that upright position, you don't have the ability to drain blood through the jugular veins. It all is going to come out through that cerebrospinal system. But if that cerebrospinal system, for whatever the reason may be, is narrow, guess what? Now, all of a sudden, you have nothing. And yes, that fluid may still be able to trickle out, but it's not able to flow as freely as it should be. And guess what's going to happen? That pressure in that cerebrospinal fluid area is going to increase. And characteristically, people are going to say, oh, I feel so much pressure behind my eyes, through the side here, through the back of my head. And it feels better when I lie down. What they basically just told you is that when they lie down, those jugular veins are able to do the work the way that they're designed. The pressure is able to alleviate itself. That is until they get back up and then that pressure starts to accumulate thereafter. So when you've got these issues that are affecting that cerebrospinal drainage pathway, that is what the authors are actually proposing could very well be the source then of causing the backflow of the pressure. And if you've got the backflow of the pressure, like this again, remember, your brain is going to be in the direct firing line. And when the brain is affected, it can show up in all kinds of different exotic ways. You look on an MRI because an MRI is looking at structure. You look at a CT, it's looking at structure. And what is it going to show? It's going to show that everything seems to look absolutely normal. It's because you're not dealing with a tumor, you're not dealing with a bleed, and you're not dealing with an infection. You're dealing with something that is affecting the way that that system works or isn't working. Add to it, MRIs, at least by and large in Australia here, they're done lying down. So there are specialized types of MRIs that do look at cerebrospinal fluid flow. They're exceptionally rare. They are exceptionally expensive. And in a lot of ways, they don't actually, you know, tell you, you know, what do you need to do in order to fix this? If it's severe enough, you may need brain surgery. You may need a shunt so that that pathway is able to be opened up. Um, but usually it's more of a, oh, okay, yeah, that is what's, you know, caused. That's what the problem is. Okay, doc, that's good. What do you do about it? And I was like, oh, I don't know. Now, this then is where, you know, Okay, what is it that, you know, somebody like myself might actually be able to do? Well, we've known at least, you know, anecdotally for a lot, a lot of years now that a lot of people who experience chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, those kinds of symptoms, they go to see an upper cervical chiropractor. That is somebody who is very precise. They don't twist crack or any of that, but they work, measure, determine the exact degree of misalignment of those vertebrae in the upper part of the neck. And they find a large amount of those people, well, guess what? They get better if they've got chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia. Some get 100% better. Some don't. Some get certain percents. Remember what we said. There's not one magic thing. There's not one magic cure. It's a lot of different pieces. But at the very least, it seems that a huge number of people, if they've got this kind of underlying mechanism going on, that something's affecting the circulation of fluid in and around the brain, 
that if you can get that upper neck lined up, that's going to go a really long way to being able to help with all of that. Now, you might be wondering what's the basis for this, and if you really want to punish yourself, there is an excellent book out there. It was written a few years ago. The fellow's name is Michael Flanagan. The name of the book is The Downside of Upright Posture. It is a very difficult book to read. I swear you nearly need a PhD in order to be able to do it. But what does he talk about? Kind of in a, just a brief nutshell. Because again, what do we do about here? We are very, very wordy. But we're very wordy so that you can actually understand what are otherwise somewhat, you know, maybe not difficult concepts, but where you need to be able to follow a logical flow so that the conclusion is like, ah, oh, that makes sense. So what he talks about is what happens to those cerebral spinal veins when they leave the brain. Remember I said they leave the brain and then they pass through the top two vertebrae in the neck right here. Well those two vertebrae, they're designed to move your head up and down and side to side. About 50% of all of the movement in your neck happens right there. And so if and when these joints are ever injured, not broken, not dislocated, but shifted and offset just enough, well what they can do is they can drag that artery and that vein along with it which then produces a little bit of stenosis or constricting and veins same thing as if we're doing that compression around here it really doesn't take that much amount of pressure to be able to lock them down if and when you live well if you live in brisbane and you're watching this you know that in the summer here it gets really really humid so a lot of people they experience what are called quote summertime headaches what's a summertime headache it's where uh when it feels like it's got a thunderstorm, I get this headache right across the base of the skull. And then the thunderstorm comes and the humidity goes away and it feels a lot better. See, that's the key. When it's humid, the veins in our body, they have the tendency to swell just a little bit. And if that area is sensitized for whatever reason, guess what? That can bring on a headache. That is a sign that you've got something that is obstructing or interfering with the normal venous flow of that blood from your brain down back to your heart through that system. It doesn't, again, mean necessarily you're going to be guaranteed to get a chronic fatigue or a fibromyalgia, but it does mean, okay, there's probably an increased chance because there's that factor right there. So blah, blah, blah. Point is, is if you've got a mechanical issue with the alignment and the motion of those joints in the upper part of the neck, it may have the potential to be affecting the drainage of fluid from your brain, which in turn can manifest as having increased amounts of pressure inside of the brain itself in such a way that that brain of yours is just not quite able to work the way that it is supposed to. And then if you can, in a conservative and a natural and in a precise, personalized manner, get those vertebrae moving the way that they are supposed to be again, well, guess what? That means it's got the better potential to be able to take the pressure off of those veins, off of that system, allow that fluid to be able to circulate the flow the way that it's designed, the way that it's meant to, so that your body can function the way that it's supposed to, so that you can ultimately do enjoy and be feeling like the person that you really want to. So again, they don't talk about any of that sort of stuff really in this particular article, but I want to show you it's not a too terribly far leap in terms of what these guys are talking about in terms of the underlying cause mechanisms of intracranial hypertension, fibromyalgia, and chronic fatigue and saying, you know what, there could very easily be a problem in the upper part of the neck that is at the very least one of the contributing factors. And if you can get that resolved, it can go a long way to being able to help you out. So that's what we've got there for you. Again, what do we do? We take a relatively simple topic. Jeff, you could have said that a lot simpler. Why did you drag it out so long? It's because I want to be able to really take the time to you know, walk you through all of these things. A lot of people with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, these different kinds of things, they've gone from specialist to specialist. Absolutely nobody is telling him not just what's going on, because part of it is, you know, in reality, nobody fully knows. But it seems a lot of times people aren't told what is possible, what is, e what is even possibly going on. And again, there's other stuff besides this that can be going on for people with fibromyalgia right now. But I do hope that by taking the time to show you how all of these bits and pieces actually come together and how they can show up in these ways 
and why you know it is so challenging and difficult to find answers for these kinds of things that nevertheless there may be other options that don't require medication that don't require surgery that don't require all of these other more invasive things that can help people be able to improve their overall quality of life so that they can do and enjoy the things that matter most to them so thank you guys for sticking with me here through to the end again like we said in the very beginning if you found that this was a useful video, if it was valuable, please, number one, like it. Please, number two, subscribe to the channel. Again, even if some of the videos aren't necessarily related to exactly what you may have going on, it goes a really long way to being able to help other people to find out the information that they may need, because otherwise you're just not going to find it at all. And then number three is... If you do know somebody who may be experiencing some of these things, please do share this video with them so that they may have a better sense and idea of what their different options would be. So thanks everybody again here for watching this video. So until next time, take care and bye-bye.